Yeah, I know what you're going to do. Yeah, yeah. And you wait until it yeah, is fine. Okay, cool. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's now five o'clock. Can I have your attention, please? Uh, the laboratory sessions, the last ones, were yesterday, and uh, the laboratory assessment sheets uh, were uploaded this morning. The deadline uh, for your first course work is uh, 6 p.m. and next uh, Friday. Now, before I move on and solve a few questions in regard to Chapter 4 for you, are there any questions? Any questions? No questions. So I've almost finished chapter four. Only a, a small a section of a chapter four is left, which I go through it on Monday. And we move on to chapter five, hopefully in the second hour of Monday's lectures. Today I would like to uh, solve a couple of examples related to circular section subject to torsion and a couple of examples related to thin walled sections subject to torsion. And if you have any questions, please ask. Now if you've got a circular cylinder subject to a torque, the torque applies a shearing stresses on any cross section which is normal to the axis of the cylinder. And in terms of a deformation, it twists the cylinder. For a circular cylinder, either solid or hollow, and the hollow obviously could be thin mold as well with uniform thickness, we can use these two equations. One for calculation of the shear stress and the other one for calculation of the angle of twist. And the units of these uh, two equations, the variables using these two equations, are given on a slide number six. Theta is angle of rotation, and the unit for it is a radian. And usually we use the rate of twist, which is, we show rate of twist by theta over L or d theta over dz. Polar second moment of area, if it's solid, we use this relation for it. If it's hollow, we use this relation for it. And if it's a thin walled, a J is equal to pi r cubed T, where r is the radius of the thin walled cylinder, and T is the thickness. This is provided the ratio between T and r is very small. Now, I started a chapter I started example uh, three for you, I believe two weeks ago I solved uh, question number three for you. Now, I will briefly go through question, I, I, no, I think I solved for you question number four and we left question number three, we couldn't finish it. Question three and four are very similar, except one of them is solid and the other one is hollow. I believe I solved question four for you, so I briefly go through question four again today and then we move on to solving question number three. So in question number four, we had a solid a circular cylinder which was subject to a torque of a 25 a kilonewton meters. The problem was asking us to design uh, this circular cylinder, this solid circular cylinder, in a way that the maximum shear stress does not exceed 90 megapascals, and the angle of twist does not exceed two and a half degrees. So question three and four are similar, except as I said, one is solid, the other one is hollow. So for the solid one, in order to design it, we just need the diameter. For the hollow one, we need both outer diameter and inner diameter. So we started with question four, these are the two requirements. The maximum shear stress remains less than 90 megapascals, and the angle of twist remains at two and a half degrees. And these are the equations that we have to use to solve the problem, and I showed you earlier. So the angle of twist equal to the torque applied, the length divided by torsional rigidity or torsional stiffness which is the product of the shear modulus and the polar second moment of area. The section is solid, so this is the equation for finding the polar second moment of area. 
So first we look at the first equation, T R over J. The maximum shear stress is 90 megapascals, which occurs on the outer layer. And R on the outer layer is equal to half the diameter. So based on this equation, we have maximum shear stress of 90 megapascals. The position of the maximum shear stress is outer diameter, so R is equal to D over 2. The polar second moment of area also written in terms of D. So from this equation, we get a value for D. So if the diameter of the cylinder is 112 millimeters, it satisfies this condition. The angle of twist should remain less than two and a half degrees. So the first thing is to convert this to radians because this equation only works when theta is in radians. So I convert two and a half degrees to radians. The torque applied is equal to 25 kilonewton meters. So 25 times 1,000 gives us a newton meters. Length is 3 meters. So I kept everything in newton and meter. So this is the polar second moment of area, and since everything is newton and meters, therefore I've used a g 85 gigapascals as 85 times 10 to the power of 9. So from this relation, we have the diameter of 120 millimeters. So if I've got 120 millimeters, it satisfies this condition and also satisfies the top condition. If I go for 112 millimeters, obviously it does not satisfy this condition. It will not be strong, uh, stiff enough to have an angular, I mean, twist less than 2.5 degrees. So the obvious choice for us is 120 millimeters. Now, question three is very similar to question four, except we have two unknowns outer diameter and inner diameter. Are there any questions in relation to this slide? No. So we move on to the second question, question number three. So this is very, very similar, except we have two, uh, two unknowns, outer and inner diameters. So I use this equation, theta equal to TL over GJ. Since both of them are unknown, therefore I can I don't have the value of j, so I write it as just a j here. From the, this equation, I can find a j. Once I have got j, then I, using the second equation, I'm a, I can find r, which is the radius of the outer diameter, because the maximum shear stress occurs on the outer diameter. So from this equation, as you can see, for a hollow cylinder, the maximum shear stress occurs on the outer layer. So in this case, we've got the outer diameter divided by 2. I found a j from the top relation. I substituted here. t is given. So from there, you can find a deal which is equal to 145 millimeters. Now, once we've got the outer diameter, I substitute in the bottom equation, and it gives me the inner diameter. So in this one, we don't have a choice. We only have one solution. Any question in relation to this example? So questions one, two, three, and four and five, they're very, very similar. They have the same thing. So I'll go through the next question for you, if there are no questions. Again, question number five is very, very similar to what we've done. Question, as I said earlier, one, two, three, four, they're very, very similar to those. In question five, if we've got a solid cylinder with a diameter of little d, we've got a hollow cylinder with the outer diameter of capital D and inner diameter of 0.75d, or three quarter of its outer diameter. We would like to compare the weight of these two cylinders, provided they are expected to transmit the same torque. These are two shafts, provided they are expe expected to transmit the same torsional load, the same torque, and also they are subject to the same maximum shear stress. 
So what these two have in common, they don't have the same dimensions. The length is similar because we are expected to compare the weight per unit length of these two shafts, but they transmit the same amount of torque and they are subject to the same shear stress. So we are going to compare their weights. So I started the solid cylinder. So for the solid cylinder, the, I calculate, it, I write J in terms of the diameter little d. The maximum shear stress occurs on the outer layer, which is d over 2. And on the right hand side, we've got a hollow cylinder. The inner diameter is given in terms of the outer diameter. So I find a J for the right shaft in terms of the capital D, the diameter. The maximum shear stress occurs on the outer layer, so I write it as D over 2. Now I'm going to compare these two equations. Two max is the same, the torque applied is the same as well. So I'm going to arrange the left equation and write it as the ratio between the torque applied and the maximum shear stress. And the same on the right hand side. Both are subject to the same torque and they are subject to the same maximum shear stress. It means these two ratios must be the same. Now I'm going to equate these two terms. When I equate these two terms, then I have a ratio between the diameter of the right hand shaft, the hollow shaft, and the diameter of the left shaft. So therefore, in this case, the diameter of the hollow shaft, outer I mean the diameter must be about 13% more than the diameter of the left shaft. Now the problem is asking us uh, to compare the weights of, the e of equal length of these two shafts. So what is the weight? The weight is the cross-sectional area multiplied by the length multiplied by the density. Say both of them are made of the same material, which are, so in that case the density is the same, so I just need uh, to compare and find the ratio between the two volumes. So this is the volume of the solid shaft, this is the volume of the hollow shaft, so if I multiply both of them by the same density I get the weights. So I don't need to do that because they're made of the same material. So if I compare the weights of these two based on this ratio I found, I can say the, left, the weight of the right shaft Sorry, the weight of the left shaft is about 77% more than the weight of the right shaft. So this is what we concluded that it's J which affects the solution. So if we increase the J by removing the material from the center, which is not carrying much load, and increase the outer diameter, we can optimize the weight of the shafts. The majority of shafts in industry they are hollow, they are not solid shafts. The only time uh, they are solid is when a space is limited. Then there is no other choice, Is you need to go for a solid shaft. But the majority of them are hollow. So any questions in regard to the two questions I just covered? Let's take photos of um, solutions on the board. We can take photo of everything we want except me. Okay. Right. So if there are no questions, we move on to the second part of this chapter. The second uh, part of this uh, chapter, we analyze a thin uh, wall section subject to torsion. The thin wall sections could be closed and could be open. The open ones, we are going to cover it on Monday. So I finished uh, the closed uh, section uh, thin wall uh, structures, subject to torsion, and they could be single cell and it could be multi-cell tube subject to torsion. The assumptions we made was that 
the shape is arbitrary. Material properties will allow to change around the section. The thickness is also allowed to change around the section. So thickness is allowed to vary, material properties are allowed to vary, and the shape could be anything. And also because it is very thin, uh, through thickness variation of shear stress is also negligible. So we just have one value for shear stress at each location, or one value of a shear flow at each position. So when we had a thick wall cylinder subject to torsion, we could not make this assumption because through thickness variation of shear stress is not negligible. The shear stress is equal to torque applied, the radius divided by J. So the shear stress depends on the position with respect to the center of the tube. But for thin wall sections, through thickness variation of shear stress is negligible, so we have just one shear stress at each location. Now I showed you that based on the equilibrium, if we apply a torque on a single cell tube, the torque applied creates a constant shear flow around the section, a single cell, a constant shear flow around the section, regardless of the shape of the tube. And we define the shear flow as the product of the shear stress and the thickness. So shear flow is constant, but because we allow the thickness to vary, therefore shear stress is not necessarily constant. So regardless of shape, if I apply a torque to a single cell Q, we end up with a constant shear flow around the section. And based on the equilibrium or equating the torque applied to the resistant torque, I showed you that the torque is equal to two times area enclosed by the perimeter, not the cross-section, area enclosed by the perimeter, is empty space, this is called A. The torque applied is equal to two times, A times the shear flow. Or Q is equal to T divided by 2A, which A is this pink area, this hollow area. The cross-sectional area of this tube, say it is subject axial loading, is this black area. So this, are, this is the equation relating the shear flow and the torque applied. For angular twist, so we cannot use the two equations I showed you for cylinder. A few students make this mistake in exam. Those two equations are based on the assumptions made for circular cylinders. Now, if you want to find the angle of twist of this single cell, we need to use either this equation or this equation. And in majority of textbooks, you calculate the rate of twist, and then once you've got the length of the tube, you multiply it to find the total angle of rotation. So this is applicable for either in terms of Q or either in terms of the torque applied. A is the area enclosed by the perimeter, and this is a loop integral of ds over gt. What is s? s is a curvilinear coordinate system, and its origin is your choice, wherever you want to place it. So in a curvilinear coordinate system, the coordinate of any point is equal to the length of the curve, I mean, length or the distance from the origin on the curve path. So the coordinate of this point is the length of this curve here. The length of this, the coordinate of this point is length of this curve. So this is the curvilinear coordinate system. And this gives us the loop integral of ds divided by gt. We keep g and t inside the integral because we allowed the material property and the thickness to vary. So I said, for single cell, we can use either of these two. Q, as you can see, because it's constant, is outside the integral. The total energy, I showed you, we can use this equation to find it, but I don't recommend it. If you have an angle of twist, you can easily find the energy stored by the structure using this equation. Now, this equation is applicable to a multi-cell tube, but because for a multi-cell tube, Q is variable, then we have to place Q inside the equation. 
So you can see there are similarities between these two, but Q is inside. Now we move on to solving a few brief introduction to thin wall sections, closed wall substitution. Now we are going to solve question number eight. In question number eight, we've got a tube with a uniform a thickness of one and a half millimeters, and the length of the tube is a two meters. The problem is asking us to find the maximum torque that this tube can withstand, provided the maximum shear stress does not exceed 27.5 megapascals. So in this case, the maximum shear stress is given. We are after the torque. In the previous example, it was once we solved on Monday, the torque was given, we found the maximum shear stress. Here is the other way around. So this is a single cell. We've got these equations. So they're completely different with circular cylinders. So we've got the relation between the torque and shear flow, relation between the shear flow and shear stress, and angle of twist. So the thickness is uniform, of one and a half millimeters. The length is two meters, and the maximum shear stress should remain less than two, 27.5 megapascals. So that's the equation we have. Now we don't see any sign of shear stress, so we have to use this equation to change Q to shear stress. So 2A multiplied by T multiplied by 2 gives us this relation. Now the thickness is uniform. So in that case, I can say the maximum shear stress is 27.5 megapascal. A is this area, which we have got two half circles, so it makes it a full circle and a rectangle. So we've got a rectangle, which is 80 by 80. And I've got a full circle, two half circles, it makes it a full circle. So from there, you calculate A. Substitute in this, value, in this equation. You've got T, which is one and a half. So from there, you calculate T. The torque applied must be 942.7 Newton meters. How, do you know, how did you know that the value of 80 and 40 and 40 were in millimeters rather than meters, or centimeters? Because I set the question. Um, I give the millimeter. Can, because when, can you see it here? It's millimeters here. Yes. So when you, when you write here millimeters, it means everything else is in millimeters. In engineering, usually, they write millimeter inside a, a geometry for you. But sometimes, if just give you one of them, it means the rest of them are all say millimeters. Yeah. Okay, that's it. It cannot be meters, can it? Forty meters is huge. Okay. okay. So we've we've done uh, this. We've solved the first part of the question. Now we move on. To, if you have no questions, we move on to the second part. Are the questions in this in that table? The area, of course, I can. This is this area. This is forty. So that is 40 as well, so it makes it, it's not to a scale, so this is 80. Do you agree this is 80? Do you agree this is 80? Rectangle is 80 by 80, isn't it? B times H, the area of a rectangle. Okay. And this is the area of a half a circle, and this is another half, so you make it a full circle. Does it answer the question? Yeah. Okay, very good. So we move on to angle of twist. It's not to escape. It's just it's the, the, the figure is in random, so 
This is, it must be a, it must be a square. This is what you're trying to say. It must be a square. Shall we move on from the area, please? You're in second year engineering as students. I think it's a description of the problem. I've given you the description of the problem gives two meters. Is there, is there, is in description? I haven't got it with me, but I believe it's in the description of the question, two meters. So shall we go on to the angle of twist, please? Yes, okay. So the angle of twist. I'm allowed to use this equation. Could you please leave the area alone for, for the time being and we move on to more complicated cases? So this is the equation for angle of twist. I can use it provided the we have a single cell. So T at the moment is outside the integral. Q obviously has not been used. Or I can say Q divided by 2, a loop integral of ds over gt. Your choice. So we calculated, we found T. G, am I allowed to remove G from the integral and place it outside? Yes, because G is constant. The way the question is the way the question is worded means that you can easily assume that the entire chip is made of aluminium. You can also remove T from the integral because it says it Okay, I didn't integral. ask that. Okay. Thank you very much. So we are allowed uh, to remove a G from the integral because the whole section is made of aluminium. Are we allowed to remove T from integral because you the cons is the thickness is constant as well? So T can be removed as well. So we remain, the remaining part of this uh, term is a loop integral of ds. What is loop integral of ds? I start at this position, go around the section, and end up at the same uh, position. Do you agree that ds, in loop integral of ds is the perimeter of this tube? So I can say, Loop integral of ds, because t is constant, can be removed. Therefore, loop integral of ds is just the perimeter of this tube. So we've got two half circles. It makes one full circle. And we've got two flat panels. So we have got 2 times 80 plus 2 pi r. Say we are stuck together as one circle. Those 2 pi r, we've got two of them. So we have 2 times 80 plus 2 pi times 40. If I substitute in this relation, it gives me the rate of twist. Once I've got the rate of twist, I multiply by the length. It gives me the angle of twist. The answer is in radians. Then I have to convert it to degrees. Engineers are more comfortable to work with degrees. In exam, I'm happy you won't lose any marks if the description of the question doesn't tell you do it in degrees or radians. You get full marks for it. But the only thing, be careful that if this is radians per millimeter and this length is given in two meters, then you have to multiply it by 2,000, not two. If it is in radian per meter, then yes, two is fine. So it gives me the angle of twist, in radians are converted to degrees, and the final requirement is to find the strain energy stored. G is equal to 27 gigapascals. For this problem, you can also use 2 squared divided by 2G multiplied by volume because 2 is constant, the thickness is constant. However, I've used this equation, T times a theta over 2. In this relation, theta is in radians. So I'm repeating this in this case, just this example, which is relatively easy, because the shear stress is constant, we can say 12 squared divided by 2g as the strain energy is stored per unit volume, and then you multiply by the volume. So, but I say use this one, you can use it for more complicated cases as well. Any questions in relation to question number eight? Yes, please. Radiance, please, yes. Radiance, yes. 
The only time we use uh, degrees is for centigrade in chapter one, when you have extension of, you remember we had an equation which was in degree centigrade, what was L alpha delta T. For the old equations we have for angles, which you use degrees as well, we have a radians, in all the equations radians. We don't use degrees anywhere. Yes, please. You mentioned an exception for this question in the last couple of minutes. Do you oh, that? Okay. So, I sh I, if you do remember it, I write it down. If we have a component which is subject to shear, the shear stress per, a store per unit volume is 2 squared divided by 2g. Now, we can multiply this equation by the volume, provided the shear stress is constant. Now, in this case, just this case, because shear stress is constant, I don't need to perform volume integral. I just multiply this by the volume of the structure. Just this case. Because shear stress is constant, thickness is constant. Does it answer the question? So, just in this case, I can say 2 squared divided by 2g, which is the strain energy, the stored per unit volume, is equal to this value. Otherwise, I have to perform a volume integral. I have to say 2 squared dg multiplied by dv, which is this is actually a triple integral dx, dy, dz. So we've got a triple integral. So we don't need it because 2 is constant. However, I would suggest for all the cases, just use this relation, it's much easier. Does it answer the question? Okay. Any questions? Any other questions? So for multi-cell tubes, which I'm going to solve a rel relatively more complicated example for you, for multi-cell tubes, I showed you that we cannot just use equilibrium to solve a multi-cell tube topic to torsion. So we have to combine uh, the equilibrium equation. This is an external torque. These are resisting torques. We need to use this equation, equilibrium, and combine it with the compatibility equations to solve it, or compatibility equation to solve it. So when we apply a torque, all the cells, they twist with the same angle of twist. So based on this characteristic, we can combine them and solve the problem. The equation for a uh, the amount of energy stored per unit uh, for the whole uh, structure, you still can use this equation for it. So this is a slide number 15. Any questions in relation to a slide number 15? So let's solve a, s a question slightly harder than the previous one I saw for you, the ring section. It's slightly hard. It's not hard. The concept is very, very similar, but some students find this one harder than the ring section, question number 11. So in this one, we've got the cross-section of a fuselage is a 25 meter long, is made of alum as aluminum with the shear modulus of 30 gigapascals. And it's subject uh, to a torque of uh, 2 mega Newton meters. It's divided to two parts, this question. In the first part, the problem is asking us to ignore the cargo hold and solve it as a single cell subject to torsion. As you can see, it has variable thicknesses. And the radius, we assume it's a circular, so the radius is given 2 meters. So the problem is asking us, in the first part, which is a single cell, subject to a torque of 2 mega Newton meters, find uh, the shear stress in each thickness and also the angle of twist, or theta. In the second part, it assumes it's a two-cell tube. It does not ignore the cargo hold. So we've got a two-cell tube subject to the same torque. It also asks us for the second part, find uh, the maximum shear stress or shear stress in each thickness and also the angle of twist. So 
So that is question number 10. The first one is relatively easy. It's a single cell, so we've got the length, material property, shear modulus, the torque applied, the thickness is variable. So these two panels, curved panels, are one millimeter thick each one, and the top one is a half a millimeter. We can easily, using this radius, we can easily calculate the area enclosed by the perimeter, which I've already done it for you. There are different ways of doing it. You can say this part is two-thirds of a full circle, so you can find this region, which is two-thirds of a full circle, and then add uh, the area of this triangle. There are different ways of doing it. I'm sure you learned in, during GCSE, maybe before that. So the first part. So it's a single cell. We had two equations, T equal to 2AQ, relating the torque applied and the shear flow. The second equation, rate of twist, d theta over dz equal to, depends on which one you prefer, T over 4A squared, a loop integral of ds over gt. I've already calculated area, enclosed by the perimeter, and the common uh, question I usually get from the students, shall we include the thickness of the section in value of A? And the answer is no. What you see at the moment is midline of the shell. So we ignore uh, the through thickness variation of the shear stress. We just show the section by line. So this is the area. That's the equation. So I've got the torque, I've got the area, so I can easily find the constant shear flow applied. So it gives me the shear flow of about 99 Newton per millimeters. Now the next stage is finding the maximum, I mean, I mean the shear stress in each thickness. If I was told to find the maximum shear stress, I just use the maximum shear stress, obviously, in this one occurs on this thickness, which is half a millimeter. But here I'm going to calculate it for each thickness. So I start with the thickness of the floor panel, which is 2 millimeters. So what was the re equation between the shear flow and shear stress? Shear flow is the product of the shear stress and the thickness. So if I am off the shear stress, I have to divide Q by the thickness. So this gives me the shear stress applied to the floor panel, the shear stress applied to two side panels or side shells, and the shear stress on the top shell. So the maximum shear stress is about 198 megapascals. And one megapascal is one Newton per millimeter squared. Any question in relation to this slide? This? Yes, please. I noticed the, um, the answers on the thing, and they're a little similar, a little um, different. You got my, I got the Okay, um, that's all right. Whatever sorry. you see, I mean, what I'm showing you is fine. Sometimes when uh, I, we calculate A, we slightly get different value. So whatever I'm showing you are my calculations. I don't know what I've written there, but they're both correct, approximately correct. Okay, any questions in regard to this slide? So the next stage is finding the angle of, <coughs> sorry, the next stage is to find the angle of twist. So the torque applied, length for A squared, loop integral of DS over GT. The whole section is made of aluminium, so I'm allowed to, to remove a G from the integral. Am I allowed to remove T as well, not U? Am I allowed to, to remove T as well or not? No. How many of you think I should not allow, I, I sh I'm not allowed to remove T from the integral? Would you raise your hands? Excellent, well done, majority. So we are not allowed uh, to remove T from the integral because as you can see, thickness is a variable. 
Now they place the origin of the curvilinear coordinate system at any point we want. It doesn't make any difference. So here we've got the torque of uh, two mega Newton meters, which are converted to Newton meters. The length, the area, meter squared is a big structure. It's better to use Newton and meter rather than Newton and millimeter. And this is G. Now I'm going to find the loop integral of ds over t. So we've got a flow panel. The length is 3.464 meters. Its a thickness is 2. This has a central angle of 60 with a thickness of 1 millimeter, 61 millimeters. So I can say I've got 120 degrees of 1 millimeter and 120 degrees of half a millimeter meters. So the central angle for uh, the one millimeter thick, you've got 60 and 60, and this is a third of the whole circle. So this is pi d over 3, these two blue lines. The thickness is 1. Again, the central angle of the top pan, top shell is 120. So this is a third, is a thickness is half. And the flow panel is 3.46 meters and the thickness of 2 millimeters. Are you happy with what I've written here? So I repeat, this is for the top shell with the central angle of 120. Instead of writing it twice, I've divided it, I've added them up. So the central angle of 60, the central angle of 60 with the same thickness. So it's a third of the full circle. The third of the full circle and the floor panel. And these are the thicknesses. Everything in meter. So from there, we can find the angle of trees, which is about 3.342 degrees. Any question in relation to this slide? And if I was to find a, to a string energy stored, I've got this angle in radians multiplied by t divided by 2. It's, it's a larger structure, so you can see I've written it in a kilojoules. And one joule is one newton meter. Questions? Now we move on to the second part, when this is a double cell tube. For the double cell tube, we need a combination of equilibrium and compatibility equation. So if this is the torque applied, say the torque applied is anticlockwise. So the cells are not supposed to have different areas, so they cannot be subject to the same shear flow. So the torque applied says anticlockwise. Both shear flows in the cells is also anticlockwise. So I can easily find uh, the areas of the cells. The torque applied is equal to 2A1Q1 plus 2A2Q2. So I substitute the values. And from there, I find one equation. I've got two unknowns, actually, I've got three, Q1, Q2, and also the rate of twist. Now I'm going to use the compatibility equation. The two cells are actually a one system. They both rotate with the same angle. So the angle of twist of cell number one must be equal to the angle of twist, or rate of twist of the cell number two. So we're going to start with the top cell. 1 over 2A1G, so G is constant. Sometimes the material of one of them in your course, second course, work, I will change the material of the, usually the one which is between the two cells, be careful. And this one is quite straightforward, G is constant, so you can just eliminate it from both rates of twists, that is easy. 
So one of the two A1 G here at the moment in this cell G is constant so we are going round this section and divide the loop integral find the loop integral of ds over t so I start with these two shells each one of them is one millimeter and the central angle is 100 and each one is 60 degrees so the total is 120 degrees so it's a third of this the third of this uh, of this circle has a thickness of one millimeter the shear flow in it is q1 so multiply by q1 so this is this plus this for the flow panel what shall i write here not you okay <laughs> for the flow panel what shall i write Write it down. Don't say it out loud. Write it down. What do you think we should write for the floor panel? The length of the floor panel is about 3.64 meters. Okay, I didn't ask you. Just write it down. Don't say it out loud. Just write it down. What do you think I should write for the floor panel? So if you think the shear flow in the flow panel is Q1, please raise your hand. If you think the shear flow in flow panel is Q2, please raise your hand. If the shear flow in the flow panel is Q1 minus Q2, please raise your hand. Very good. So the theory is cell number one. And we are writing the equation of loop integral of ds over t. So the shear flow in the floor panel in, when we are in cell number 1 is Q1 minus Q2. Q2 is considered to be negative. And so this is the length of the floor panel. The shear flow is the difference between these two. We are in this cell, so this is considered to be positive, so Q1 minus Q2. And its uh, the thickness is two millimeters. Now this is for the top shell. The top shell has a central angle of 120 degrees, which is a third of a circle. So pi d over three is a third of a circle. The shear flow in the top one is Q1, and that's its thickness. So this is the rate of twist of the top cell. We move on to the bottom cell. The bottom cell is made of a flow panel and this shell with the central angle of 120 degrees and the thickness of one. So the flow panel in cell two is subject to a shear flow of Q2 minus Q1 because now this is considered to be positive. This is in the other side, so it's negative. This is the length and this is the thickness. Now, the bottom shell is a third of the circle, so pi d over 3 multiplied by q2 divided by its thickness. Now, if I substitute these, equate these two, substitute the values and equate these two. Oh, any. So, if I equate these two equations, then I can find a relationship between q1 and q2. Then combining it with the equilibrium equation, we can find the two unknowns, Q1 and Q2. Once we've got it, then we can, using this one of these, either this or this one, we can find the angle of twist or rate of twist. If there are no questions on this slide, I move on. So, but combining those two equations, we find Q1 and Q2. Once we've got the Q1 and Q2, using one of those two equations I showed you earlier, we can find the angle of twist. If multiplied by the length, we find the total twist angle. 
and the shear stress in the floor panel. This is very important here. The shear stress in the floor panel is the difference between the two divided by the thickness of the panel, which this is what <coughs> I've done here. It's 5.4 megapascals. So the shear stress in the remaining ones are just the shear flow Q1 or Q2 divided by the thickness. Just this one is a slightly different. I think this is the question one of the students asked me earlier. And this is the, I don't think I've got the energy, so I think it's now 10 minutes to 6, so it's going to stop recording anyway. So. Are there any questions? So thank you very much and have a nice weekend. So thank you as well. We move on. I finish, as I said earlier, I finish a very small section left from chapter 4. I finish it on Monday. We move on to chapter 5. No question? Thank you very much. And see you on Monday. Bye, Bye.
Or like if you ask to you, it doesn't need But that's, that's it. Actually, it was good. Now you know like, how important it is. Yeah. You know, you just make sure you get the receipt. You receive a receipt, if not, Yeah, it's a lesson learned. And at least it's only a small amount. Alright, thank, thank you. you. Okay, have a nice weekend.